It is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Kenneth Howe is the CEO of Holman Howe Funeral Homes and a 25-year veteran funeral home owner. His firm is a multiple pursuit of excellence winner, including the Best of the Best Award in 2015. Ken was named the 2012 Funeral Director of the Year by American Funeral Director Magazine. He is the former chairman of Mercy Hospital Foundation and the president of the Mercy Board of Directors. Dana jones Wynn is the owner and president of C and CEO of jones Wynn Funeral Home and Cremation Service of Villa Rica in Douglasville, Georgia. She is also the owner and president of Meadowbrook Memory Gardens in Villa Rica, Georgia. Dana is a licensed funeral director who has actively served in committee and leadership roles with both the National Funeral Directors Association and the Georgia Funeral Directors Association. She is a longtime member of the NFDA Pursuit of Excellence Committee and currently serves as the program's co-chair with Ken. Jones Wynn Funeral Homes have proudly served the, the have proudly earned the Pursuit of Excellence Award every year since 2003. Jones Wynn earned earned the Best of the Best Award in 2007 and were inducted into the Hall of Excellence Award in 2012. Jessica Coase, our NFDA Public Relations, Relations Manager, has been on the NFDA staff for more than 10 years and her career in public relations spans nearly 17 years. Jessica manages NFDA's media relations efforts and our social media presence. She edits the NFDA Bulletin, assists members with communications issues, and serves as staff liaison to the NFDA Pursuit of Excellence program. Jessica was named by Funeral One to be one of the eight women funeral professionals you should know about in 2015. And now let's get started. Jessica, I'll turn the controls over to you. Thank you, Heather. Okay, I'm going to go back here. Okay, um, thank you so much um, everyone for uh, joining us here today um, and welcome to my uh, Pursuit of Excellence Committee uh, co-chairs, Ken um, and Dana. Um, Ken and Dana, did you want to say any uh, words of welcome? Good yeah, afternoon. Wanna... Okay. The NFDA Pursuit of Excellence Award Program has been in existence for more than 35 years, and it offers achievement in essential areas of your business. As folks put together their entry for their funeral home, they'll be required to take a look at how their firms measure up to um, various criteria that define funeral service excellence, and it encourages you and your staff to really uh, do what you can to exceed the expectations of the families and communities you serve. The Pursuit of Excellence program and its standards can inspire your staff to think about creative ways that you can be serving families, fresh approaches for community outreach programs, um, innovative ways that you can be advertising and marketing your funeral home, and so much more. These new approaches will help strengthen and improve your funeral home's reputation, not only within the funeral service profession, but even more importantly, within your community. As we all know, consumer needs are changing. Families are looking for more personal and unique funerals. And stepping up your game is, uh, will show people in your community that your firm can de deliver the meaningful end of life experiences that they're looking for. While pursuit of excellence may not be the sole reason a family would choose your funeral home over one of your competitors, it does offer an important point of distinction and it tells your commu community that your funeral home has been recognized on an international level for the way it goes above and beyond in service to families in the community. Today we're going to share a few award-winning ideas that came from funeral homes that have earned the pursuit of excellence award. Some of these ideas are really, really simple and easy to implement, and some of them are perhaps a little bit more complex, but we hope that they're going to inspire you and get your creative juices flowing um, so that you might try something new in your funeral home and in your community. So why should you be doing something different? As um, Ken and Dana and all of you know, the families you're serving today are very different and they want very different things um, than the families that came through your door 15 or 20 years ago. You 
simply can't keep doing things the way they've always been done and expect your business to survive and thrive. That's just not a sustainable approach for your business. So let's just take a quick, really quick look at how things have changed. Um, this is no surprise. We're at a tipping point where cremation is outpacing burial, and it's not something that's going to change. As you can see, in just a few short years, we're going to be approaching a point where the cremation rate is um, over 60%. For families in the United States, the reason they prefer cremation very widely, cost is a factor for some, but other reasons play into their decision as well. We're also seeing a decline um, in the importance of religion. It's um, For many families, it's just not an important component of the funeral. And this reflects a broader trend that we're seeing here in the United States, that people are generally less religious than they were a few years ago. We're seeing um, the important, as we're seeing the importance of religion declining, we're seeing an increased interest in funeral celebrants who can help fill the gap when families don't have a close tie to a church or religious tradition um, or, you know, families who, you know, don't consider this themselves religious, but they're spiritual. Celebrants can help them plan a meaningful funeral. Green funerals are also something to keep an eye on. Um, just over half of the folks who responded to the latest um, NFDA consumer survey were interested in exploring green funeral options. And there are many other trends that we're seeing to various degrees throughout the country. Um, this change isn't something that, you know, we're seeing, going to be seeing five or 10 years down the road. It's something that's here. And so we have to adapt to meet the needs of those families. So even if your community is somewhat traditional, these changes are going to be slowly seeping in. And again, because those consumer needs are changing, um, it's challenging to connect with consumers. And so it's up to you to try new things, um, you know, whether it's a community outreach program or um, something that you're offering to uh, the grieving families that you're serving, so trying something new to catch their eye. Um, because those things, catching their eye, it's all about getting them to walk in the door. Um, and that's going to help boost your funeral home's profile in the community and make consumers think of your funeral home first when they need the services of a funeral director. So let's dive in and talk about some of the Pursuit of Excellence award-winning ideas that can help you meet the emerging needs of um, the families that you serve and raise the bar on funeral service excellence. So marketing, advertising, and public relations are obviously important to any funeral home. It's, you know, often how families learn about you. And marketing and advertising, it's a rapidly evolving area for all businesses, in, including funeral homes. And in this day and age where people have short attention spans, it can be a real challenge to catch people's eye. Um, and social media is one of those emerging platforms on which you can market and advertise your funeral home. Um, Dana, let's um, talk a little bit about your funeral home. And I know you've um, early on were very active on social media. So how is uh, how are you using social media to reach consumers in your um, own community? And um, how has that helped your funeral home? Thank you, Jessica. And thank you for letting, allowing me time to be with you today. We uh we use social media, and I think that's an interesting uh, concept. I think we all use social media, um, and it's what you said. Some of the uh, people have short attention spans, so sometimes it can be that uh, something that's unexpected that will catch their eye or that will get the best results. But we use, uh, like everybody, I think the uh, NFBA member survey showed that 95.3% of us use our websites, which is, you know, understandable. That's our anchor. That's how our services are researched a lot of times. We use uh, Facebook, and I, the survey showed 60.9% of the people do. We use Facebook to showcase what we do, and um, we target our area. In um, social media, can use the Facebook can use even when we have a 
somebody's lost a loved one and we can't quite understand who they might be, we can use Facebook to look up that family or uh, get a better understanding of who we're going to serve. But we uh, also uh, use um, some degree um, emails uh, and texting uh, and Instagram. That is a lower percentage that people use. Um, their survey showed 1.9 percent and probably you don't get exact results or quick results results from instagram and then when we use facebook we get pretty quick results of, um, of what we see on facebook of you know likes or comments but that uh, facebook is a good way for us that we use for marketing uh, networking and that uh, it makes us our small town small again because it seems to draw us all together and um there are opportunities to share obituaries and grief resources and information about our community through Facebook. And I know uh, Ellen has, and our staff has done, we've done um, community, um, I would say, giveaways or different uh, ways to reach out and ask the people to join us in a, um, something that would we'd give away at the end. And it causes a lot of uh, uh, activity on our Facebook and it generates a lot of chatter or comments. Um, and I know there is a um, one of the uh, funeral homes that is a POE uh, participant is Brunswick, Brunswick Memorial Funeral Home, and they had uh, on social media they in East Brunswick, New Jersey, they held a Share the Love contest, and the intended prize for one winner was going to be an exclusive chef's table luncheon at the renowned Heirloom Kitchen, and that was one of the country's um, uh, top cooking school and it was where they were on Valentine's Day they asked on social media they invited everyone of the age of 18 who had lost a loved one uh, or just someone that they had loved and cared for to share their love story that was so overwhelming that um, that there's Facebook uh, it generated around 50, 68 65 percent of um, well, they did, it, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but it was such an overwhelming uh, participation for the people with their love stories that they award, they picked 15 different w winners for that. And then another funeral home used social media, they used Facebook, um, educating communities about issues like drug overdose or suicide. It's, it, that's nothing new for us, unfortunately. We, we see that. The social media was another great way to care for to carry out a message for Kramer Funeral Home in Palouse, Washington. They conducted a very successful outreach campaign during the National Suicide Prevention Awareness Month, and that was in September. And they, were, they used um, Facebook, and it was themed of the campaign was Your Life Matters. And uh, they uh, posted uh, different uh, Facebook posts, and it generated, and this one did have statistics, 65% uh, of their page views on Facebook were a result of these educational posts about suicide. And one of them was as simple as, hi, I care. Uh, and it was uh, very successful for them to, it, because it's unfortunate from our veterans to our young people, um, the focus that we need sometimes or is for our suicide risk factors that we need to focus in on them. And so this one was a very uh, successful Facebook community outreach program for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it's um, it, it's amazing how um, social media has really become so important, um, you know, not only just maintaining a presence on Facebook, but, you know, we see so many funeral homes doing advertising on Facebook, and it's actually really successful in generating good results um, for those funeral homes. So if it's not something you're currently doing, um, I encourage you to learn a little bit about it. You know, certainly, um, you know, at NFDA, we have different resources that you can turn to. And um, I know at various conferences and conventions, there are um, expert um, experts presenting workshops where you can learn more about this. But um, 
I encourage you to explore it. It's really um, a great way to reach out and touch your community, especially when it's done well and you're doing surprising things like having contests or uh, putting out these um, educational messages, um, you know, perhaps about suicide or um, the opioid crisis, if that's something that's really um, touching your community. Um, but sometimes even traditional advertising and marketing methods like, uh, you know, newspaper advertisements, things like that, um, can really bring great results, especially if you're willing to try something really new. Um, Ken, I, I know last year we had um, a, a really interesting program um, that took sort of the newspaper advertisement, if you will, and really turned it completely on its head, and they actually won one of our Best of the Best awards. So can you talk a little bit about that, Ken? Absolutely, I'd be glad to. Traditional advertising methods can generate outstanding results, especially if you're willing to take a risk and try something new. One firm who we were so impressed with last year to award the best of the best award to and to nominate it for the vote <clears throat> was the Old Bridge Funeral Home in Old Bridge, New Jersey. It deserved this best best award more than any I've seen recently, not because it was just a marketing tool. It was an outstanding of an example outstanding example of community involvement. Too often the news is filled with negative stories. And during a meeting of the Old Bridge Business Alliance, a group of local business leaders who are charged with helping the township's Office of Economic Development created growth and energy in the community. The funeral home staff proposed the development of a news publication that would highlight positive news in the community. So in essence, this funeral home was instrumental in establishing a brand new news publication for their community. The idea received support from everyone, including the mayor, the town's business administrator, the town council and other business leaders, and the Old Bridge Economic Development Officer. Thus, all around Old Bridge, their publication was born. And just the thought that a news publication was born in the heart of a funeral home to me was just an outstanding, outstanding idea. In uh, the Old Bridge Funeral Home wanted the all, all, all around Old Bridge publication to be a community newspaper and created at no expense to the taxpayers or the subscriptions. The cost of the publication and the distribution is supported by advertising revenue from the local businesses, just like any other newspaper. Each month, the newspaper features a letter from the mayor, information on the work of the council, news from the schools, and the Senior Citizen Center and reports from the municipal authorities and community event announcements, business news, and perhaps the most popular, free obituaries. Every funeral home uh, struggles with the idea of increased costs for death notices and obituaries in news publications, and this funeral home took the initiative to address that head on. And how impressive could that be? In less than 10 months, the paper has grown from 16 pages to 28 pages, and mailed to over 27,000 addresses in the township. Old Bridge Funeral Home stated in its entry to us that reports from local businesses and vendors had increased foot traffic in their stores and increased sales and revenue. Local institutions, local institutions have increased attendance in their services and programs. To know what was going wrong, going, uh, going on in Old Bridge made that newspaper the place to go and has made a type of impact that has left everyone involved speechless. And it was all born out of the local funeral home. We can't be afraid to take risks. Consumers these days have, port, have short attention spans, and sometimes the unexpected will generate the best results. That's right, Ken. Um, and beyond advertising and public relations and social media, um, having a strong presence in your community or simply put making your business be a good neighbor in the community can mean a lot. Um, Ken, can you tell me about um, some of the interesting community outreach programs that the Pursuit of Excellence uh, program honored last year? There was one um, really interesting one from one of our um, firms in the Philippines. Yes, one of our best of the best award winners from last year is a great example of a very simple and easy to implement idea that had a tremendous impact on their community. The funeral home was Arlington Memorial Chapels in the Philippines. 
2016 was marked by many terrible events around the globe, terrorist attacks in Europe and the Zelka epidemic in Brazil, civil unrest in Venezuela, Venezuela and weather disasters, extrajudicial killings in the Philippines and much more. The employees of the Arlington Memorial Chapel felt that they and their community could serve as a counterpoint, counterpoint to all the negativity in the world by performing small acts of kindness. As the firm noted in its entry, they stated, whatever we do to any person around us affects that person. In turn, that act of kindness can also affect the other person, causing a ripple effect, a, an effect of kindness. In doing so, we create a more positive world. Thus, their program, called the Tree of, of Kind, was born. During the holidays, many funeral homes set up Christmas trees on which they hang ornaments inscribed with the names of the individuals for whom they cared for over the past year. Arlington turned that idea on its head. They erected a tree in the lobby of their funeral home with ornaments. One side looked like a wrapped Christmas present and the other one was blank. The community and the employees of the firm were invited to conduct a random act of kindness and then write down what they did on the back of that ornament. The project kicked off and the tree lit on the anniversary of the death of the Arlington Memorial, Cha Memorial Chapel founder, Nestor Lopez. Initially, the funeral home had 100 ornaments, but by the second week in December, they had to add more because so many people came in to share their random act of kindness. Arlington Memorial Chapel staff also noted that members of the community visited the tree just to read what the acts of kindness had been and had been shared by their neighbors. We never know or have heard or count of the heads of the people who have been touched through this project, stated the Arlington Memorial in their entry. We believe that by doing this, we have created one small ripple effect in this part of the world that can create a tidal wave. We hope others can replicate this project so that the ripple effect continues. And that's what they stated that they did by creating a positive program in their community that was completely mm -hmm. unexpected. Yeah. And Ken, um, you know, sometimes um, community outreach programs bring um, people into your funeral home for something completely unrelated to funeral service. And we had a great idea um, from one of our firms in the state of Washington. Yes, the Weeks Dyer Mortuary in Tacoma, Washington, tapped into a really great outreach program that gets people into the funeral home, but has nothing to do with funeral service. As we all know, there are many myths that persist about funeral homes and funeral directors. To help show their community a different side to the profession and the people who are serving grieving families there, Weeks Dryer Funeral Home hosts a quarterly family movie night. Hosted at the funeral home, these events featured an animated or family-friendly movie, beverages and snacks, including popcorn and crafts and activities for the children. For some, these movie nights are the first time that they've ever been into a funeral home or interacted with the funeral director outside of a funeral service. The family movie night has been very successful and attendance continues to grow and attendees are grateful for the opportunity to see their local funeral home in a completely new and positive light. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I think that's really great because getting people into a funeral home when it's nothing related to funeral service, I think sometimes that makes it easier for families when they do have to come into a funeral home when they do have the death of a loved one. It makes the experience a little less intimidating because they, you know, are familiar with the funeral home and with the people who work there. Um, there are various niche groups within communities that offer um, great opportunities for outreach programs. For example, Schools um, offer a lot of opportunities for you to show your support for the community. Um, there was a funeral home in Delaware that won one of the best of the best awards last year, and they did an outstanding, they uh, created this entire program for high school students. Can you tell me a little bit about that, Dana? Yes, I can. That was Spicer Mulliken, Mulliken, Mulliken Funeral Home and Crematory in Newcastle, Delaware. They're always looking for useful ways to country, make a contribution to local communities and to be active and a visible part of the neighborhood and where their employees live and work. They identified an opportunity to reach out to the high school students with the assistance of a few teachers, and they called it, uh, this curriculum the Science Behind Funerals. The Science Behind Funerals it, they created was a 
45 minute PowerPoint presentation that focused on the science, technology, engineering, and math that was part of the budget, the math part, involved in the funeral service profession. They included information about the profession itself, the history of embalming, the social side of funeral directors that use every day, and the math, the budget, the engineering involved in digging grades, and much more. The goal of the presentation was twofold. First, they wanted to introduce high school students who ordinarily may have little or no contact with the uh, interaction with a funeral home or to the profession. And then they wanted to be able to dispel myths and encourage students to consider a career in funeral service. The second goal was to encourage students to think about what was on their bucket list, both, both personally and professionally. And at the end of the presentation, students receive a bucket list notebook, which Spice or Mulliken hopes will serve, hopes which would serve as a catalyst for a discussion with loved ones about life goals, the things they learned, and how students might like to remember the lives of loved ones and how they themselves might like to be remembered. They felt they found this program very successful, and that they uh, generated talk with the students and they interacted with students and they learned what uh, teen, teenage students were thinking about when it comes to death and dying. They also realized that the curiosity was there and what we do as funeral directors and it was very high on their list of wanting to know. And they were very encouraged and that courage that the younger generation embraced funeral service and what it really means. Okay. And Ken, um, there was another great um, idea from one of um, uh, related to schools and young children from one of our award recipients in Connecticut. Can you talk a little bit about that idea? Yes, it was the Gallagher Funeral Home in Stanford, Connecticut. The funeral home there wanted to connect with a local school in a very creative and educational way. Knowing the importance of reading, they decided to partner with a school on a book character pumpkin decorating contest during Halloween. Through this contest, students were encouraged to decorate pumpkins to represent their favorite book characters. The pumpkins could be decorated with paint and markers as well as many other craft supplies such as glitter, pipe cleaners, and fabric. A contest application was sent home with each of the students to allow the students an opportunity to express interest in participating in the contest as well as a chance for parents to give their permission for participation. More than 40 students signed up. The funeral home delivered a bin of pumpkins, and you can see that on your screen, directly to the school. The students were then able to take the pumpkins home and had a week to create their masterpieces. Each pumpkin was brought back fully decorated on the day of the school's annual Halloween party. Book characters came to life as they lined the auditorium stage. The talent and the creativity of children ages four years and up became quickly apparent. The funeral home staff had to take on the monumental task of awarding prizes to the top winning pumpkins. I'm glad I didn't have that assignment. All students were given a medal for participation while there was one winning pumpkin per grade. At the end of the judging, one grand prize pumpkin was chosen. In addition to the recognition as the grand prize winner, Fancy Nancy's creator won a pizza party for their class. It turned out to be a fun and educational event for all the students involved. Yeah, yeah, and you can see um, the Fancy Nancy pumpkin, um, for those of you who are familiar with children's books, um, right there um, on the right side of the screen. Um, another niche group that um, funeral homes can target are um, police officers and firefighters and first responders. Um, the work that these people do every single day in the community is amazing and um, doing something to honor and recognize them can really bring a community get together and you saw that um, last year in your own uh, funeral home right Dana? <laughs> That's right we did. I don't think we ever expected our police and firefighters support risk bands to be as popular as they were. Sometimes it's a small act of kindness that means the most to our first responders. We work alongside law enforcement officers and firefighters every day. We wanted to show our support and gratitude for the dangerous work that these men and women do every day. Our staff, we got together and we discussed several ideas and we settled on creating special wristbands to honor these first responders. 
So we got to work creating the wristbands. For police, we designed a black wristband with a blue line down the middle. And for our firefighter, firefighters, a black wristband with a red stripe. As soon as the wristbands were delivered to the funeral home, we posted about their availability on our Facebook page. It was overwhelming. We ran out of wristbands so quickly that we we were uh, taken, uh, it took our breath away. We, we were suddenly, so we got busy and reordered more. It was a very successful and and very, and it enabled us as a funeral home and the people in our community to come together to honor the sacrifice of these local heroes. And uh, our staff got, they saw the popularity of the Facebook and uh, people coming into the funeral home. They started carrying them with them out in the community. If they were going out for lunch, they had some extras and they would uh, give them away. Uh, we also had a, a local person call us and they wanted 200 to give out. So it, it just it, it, it just started and it, it was far reaching. People far and wide um, wanted to know. I think we gave over uh, 5,000 away on this. Our gesture to remember our first responders was over the top by being received. Yeah, that's outstanding, Dana. Um, senior citizens are perhaps an obvious uh, point of contact um, and group that you might consider reaching out to. After all, the folks that you're going to be caring for as funeral directors, but it's important to think beyond just doing things like pre-planning seminars. Um, there was a great idea from an Indiana funeral home that was among last year's awards re award recipients. Can you talk a little bit about uh, their unique program, Ken? I'd be glad to. You know, we all know that the loss of a spouse poses many challenges, including many just simple things on a daily uh, manner, like making dinner. Most recipes that are found in cookbooks or online are made to yield four to six servings. This could lead to overeating or food going to waste. It could also deter someone from the kitchen and lead them towards unhealthy eating habits, such as visiting fast food restaurants, eating TV dinners, or even skipping meals. One of the funeral directors at Meredith Clark Funeral Home in Morgantown, Indiana, also had a degree in dietetics, dietics, I think it is the word, and came up with a great idea. She began to gather an easy to prepare recipe that yield only two servings. After adding nutritional information, the recipes were compiled into a cookbook. The funeral home hosted a food demonstration event during which attendees received a copy of the cookbook and learned how to make some of the recipes. The event was initially targeted toward widows and widowers in the community, but the funeral home has since expanded the program to include anyone who might be interested in learning how to cook on a smaller scale. Yeah, that's um, that's outstanding. Um, let's see. Um, as we talked about before, um, taking traditional advertising and marketing methods and doing something unexpected expected um, advertising and or I'm sorry aftercare as well as you know your grief and bereavement programs that funeral uh, homes um, offer to the community is another great idea where you can really think outside the box and try something unexpected um, Dana do you want to talk um, perhaps about um, one of the ideas that we saw last year yeah, I would, and that's exactly right. One funeral home did just that, and it was Kilpatrick Funeral Home in West Monroe, Louisiana. They used the biblical-based grief share program in their funeral home, and I'm sure some of you who are listening may be familiar with that. And as they were working their way through the program, the funeral director leading the program noticed that a few of the women who were participating we're having a particularly tough time moving on, or I, as I've been there and understand they're walking in their grief journey. So after talking with them, she got they got concerned that the program might not be reaching them. So after talking with them individually and as a group, she discovered that the ladies had something in common. They all enjoyed painting. Some used oil paint, others used watercolors, and one used, uh, used to teach chime painting. The women who used to teach child painting agreed to teach the group this special art. 
the funeral home got busy. They secured a space for the class. They purchased paint, cups, plates, saucers for the women to paint. The classes were held weekly, and it was a huge success. Soon the ladies were having fun and forming friendships. They soon began having potluck lunches in conjunction with the classes. And best of all, their hearts were healing. The owner of the funeral home serves as, a, as the president of the local food bank, which holds an annual empty bowls, bowls fundraiser. They were in need of individuals to donate bowls for this event. So she asked the ladies if they would be willing to help, and they enthusiastically said yes. Between them, they donated 40 bowls to the fundraiser. This project has turned out to be a real winner, not just because these widows began to make progress in their grief journey, but also because they were able to give back to the community. So it was thinking outside the box. It fell in the category of something unique and different, and that the ladies loved it. And uh, so the uh, grief share program they were using was used, but they reached beyond that to reach these ladies. And I found it interesting, um, it's something that you were talking about a while ago, Jessica and Ken, about the senior adults and, I, and this one that you use this and we're having pot, look, lunches. When we have um, groups in a funeral home or, or widows together, or ladies, we find that we, we like to provide them something to eat, but we often find that they like to bring a dish to share, or as we saw, call it in the South here, a covered dish. And we actually, <laughs> I I had to think that through, why would they want to bring something instead of us providing their lunch? Well, it's simple, as I think back through grief. When you have a loved one that dies, that care, that love, that concern is ripped away from you. you you're, you're not able to give them what you want to nurture, nurture them. So those covered dishes or those potluck lunches are their way of giving to each other, nurturing and caring for each other. That's great, Dana. Um, and that brings up, you know, such a good point about, you know, widows and widowers having, you know, all this love and, you know, still wanting to care for others and they want to, they want to, you know, still continue to share um, that with folks. And it, it goes um, back just, sorry, it goes back yeah. just no, go ahead. Those, it goes back to what all of us funeral directors do. We plan their funerals. We help them through their grief, and we help them with their cremations by listening to what they're not saying. So I was watching those potlucks or covered dishes. So it goes back to what we all do. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Um, honoring um, veterans is another great way not only to engage with um, veterans and their families, but it can really turn into something that involves the entire community. And Ken, we had a really great um, veterans event that was one of the finalists for um, our Best of the Best Award last year. Can you talk a little bit about that idea? I'd be glad to. That was the Hometown Heroes event that was hosted by the Reynolds Junkoff Funeral Home and Cremation Services in Traverse City, Michigan. Reynolds Junkoff has an annual tradition of honoring local veterans and has done so with events ranging from luncheons to USO dinner dances. They have been a longtime champion of veterans. Inspired by the honor flights that take veterans to Washington, D.C. To, to see the statues and the monuments dedicated to their honor, the funeral home their staff organized a hometown hero a tour of the Traverse City's war memorials and monuments. The funeral home coordinated more than 20 organizations in executing this event. The day started at the U.S. Coast Guard Station, where 122 veterans and guests were presented with a special pin and boarded one of the four buses, and they were given a police motorcycle escort throughout the tour. The tour stopped at nine different memorials in that community and monuments throughout the city, including a rest stop at the local VFW post where the veterans delight, were delighted in seeing combat vehicles such as tanks and ambulances and jeeps. The grand finale was a stop at the Veterans Memorial Park where the veterans were joined by friends and family members of the community. They were honored with the Pledge of Allegiance, a presentation of the colors by the VFW and the American Legion, and an address by the commander Greg Mattress of the United States Coast Guard and a performance by the Shoreliners Quartet. The tour concluded with a luncheon at the U.S. Coast Guard Canteen during which each veteran was 
presented with a special challenge coin. With sirens wailing, the motorcycle escort drew lots of attention and cheers of appreciation for hometown heroes, the entry noted. The veterans enjoyed being together as a group with all the branches of the military being represented. After months of planning, this unique veterans appreciation event was both educational and inspiring for both participants and the staff and all the volunteers. Yeah, that, that's it's such an outstanding idea, and it's really impressive um, the way that they brought, um, what was it, 20 different organizations in the community together to honor veterans. That, you know, takes a tremendous amount of coordination, um, and it's, it's amazing how so many great ideas like this hometown heroes of events that were um, highlighted here today, um, you know, great ideas like that uh, that we see every year, um, you know, events ranging from this hometown heroes to, you know, some of those simple ideas like the tree of a kind program that um, our friends in the Philippines put together. The ideas that Ken and Dana shared today are just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the amazing things that funeral homes of all different sizes are doing throughout the country and even around the world to ensure that families and communities, uh, to, to ensure that they're serving families and communities to the best of their abilities. If you'd like to see even more of the award-winning ideas from the Pursuit of Excellence program, you can, um, uh, find them on the NFDA website. We have them organized by year. I think we have the last um, five years uh, posted there, and they're organized by category. So if you're looking for a veterans program or perhaps um, an outreach idea for children, teens, and schools, you can find them easily categorized um, in that way. We know that um, so many of you uh, today um, that are tuning into this call are stepping up and serving families and your communities in exceptional ways every single day. Um, I know that sometimes as funeral directors and as, as funeral homes, you may not think that what you're doing is um, special or extraordinary because it's just what you do to care for people every single day. But um, trust me, as someone who isn't a licensed funeral director, but who has, you know, been working in this profession now for more than 11 years, when I hear your stories, I am blown away by the things that you do in your communities. Um, so this might be the year that you want to consider applying for the Pursuit of Excellence Award. Um, we're at the beginning of March, which gives you plenty of time to compile your entry and get it into us by the July 15th deadline. Um, Ken and Dana, do you want to talk a little bit about why participating in Pursuit of Excellence is important and what it's meant to you and your firm? Yes, Maybe we can I would start love with Yeah. Yeah, Dana, why don't you start? <laughs> okay, sorry. Oh, I believe in it so much. Um, it, PL, the P, Pursuit of Excellence is designed for the large firms and the small, and from the small firms to the large firm, it's for everybody. And the Pursuit of Excellence, our books or our entries online, it's, it's just a museum of history of years served. Well, we're just like everybody on this line that's listening. Uh, we are community service oriented and just like you, we are we are intensely involved in our community and we find our participation with POE that gets us more involved, involved deeper and more meaningful. It keeps us current and keeps us relevant. We always hear of ideas and we, we take those ideas and we adapt them to our site and uh, we find that we can use them in different ways. It's just the POE is an excellent way to have the deeper roots. Since we all do this and we all are participating in the community and we all love our families and our communities, all you have to do now is document your community service, record your efforts, fill out a POE uh, application, and voila, you are a participant and you'll be glad you did. Okay, great. Thanks, Dana. Ken, do you want to talk a little bit about um, Pursuit of Excellence and um, what it's meant for you? Well, I think one of the keys to the Pursuit of Excellence program, as, as Dana said, is that it, it just forces you to organize your thoughts and be intentional in your plan. And many of the funeral homes that uh, would be interested in the Pursuit of Excellence program are already doing many of these programs. But 
by participating in the program and networking with all the people who participate, it just raises the tide for everyone. You see an idea that someone is doing in another state that you take and reconfigure it to work in your community. And that networking all the way across the board just causes the entire profession to rise and be able to be more relevant, as Dana said, to the, each individual community in which we're serving. The idea may not work exactly as some other funeral home did it, but it could be replicated in a way that was more relevant to your particular market. So it's just a very good way for funeral homes to uh, not only network with each other, but then go out and spread that networking into the community and be a part of the community life in an additional way other than just being a death care provider. That's right. That's right. And um, and I think you both touched on this. It real, uh, Participating in the pursuit of excellence, it really encourages you to take a step back and look at everything that you've accomplished as a funeral home during the last year. I know as funeral directors, you all are so busy and so focused on serving families every single day. That's, of course, your priority and, you know, at the heart of what it is that you do that, you know, sometimes you maybe don't have time to take a step back and reflect on the things that you have accomplished or to even do some planning for the year ahead. Um, but Pursuit of Excellence gives you a framework to do that, um, you know, by looking at education and community outreach and the programs and services that you're offering to uh, the families that you serve and your advertising. Um, it gives you an opportunity to maybe plan out your activities for the year, but also then at the end of the year to reflect back and record um, the things that you've accomplished in that last year. Um, and when you look at some of the um, amazing ideas that are submitted, it inspires you to do even more in your funeral home next year. And, you know, I ha I've had um, uh, funeral homes that have earned the Pursuit of Excellence Award say that their staff gets really excited and inspired by earning the Pursuit of Excellence Award, that they're, you know, constantly coming up with new ideas and, um, you know, they're energized because they want to do more and they want to achieve more. Um, within the funeral home so that they can earn the uh, Pursuit of Excellence Award next year. So it can be incredibly um, inspiring to go through that process of compiling an entry. And um, admittedly, it's, you know, perhaps a little bit intimidating that first year, but I think as many um, funeral homes who have participated in Pursuit of Excellence for a number of years can attest that going through that process and putting the entries together, it gets a little bit easier once you're, um, you know, familiar with the criteria and um, kind of get yourself into that rhythm of participating. Um, all of the information that you need to know about participating in Pursuit of Excellence can be found on the NFDA website. Um, you can also call um, your NFDA member services representatives or my, myself, um, and we can um, help you get started. Um, we're also happy um, if you've never participated in Pursuit of Excellence before, and you're maybe looking for a little bit of extra help and guidance, um, the members of our our uh, committee are always happy to talk with you and help you out and answer questions as you're putting together your entry um, to kind of, you know, take some of the, um, the challenge out of it and, you know, make sure that you're headed um, in the right direction. So that help is there. Please uh, take advantage of it. And um, we hope that you know we'll see some uh, new names and, and faces um, as the, as we um, look at our entries um, coming up later this summer. So I think we have um, some time now for a few questions. Heather, thank you so much, Jessica, and thank you so much, uh, Ken and Dana. These are some amazing stories and amazing points for people to take away. So we do have questions and answers time. Um, please feel free to use your control panel to enter your questions. And if you do think of a good question that as soon as we end today's webinar, um, but you didn't get a chance to enter it into your control panel today, please feel free to email us that at nfda.nfda.org. 
Um, so Jessica, our first question that has come in is, we are a team of two. We would not be able to do a veteran tour. How would we get started on this kind of thing? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, I, I mean, doing a big veterans tour, I mean, that's um, – um, along the lines of the idea that we described here. I mean, that's obviously quite an undertaking and certainly a two-person funeral home um, might not be able to do that. Um, but perhaps it's, um, I'd again encourage you, and I'm going to, do I still have control, Heather? I want to go back. Um, we have our innovative no, ideas um, uh, section here, and there's lots of great um, ideas on, on well, a wide range of scales, um, you know, everything from, you know, something very simple to, you know, those more um, elaborate ideas like the one we described here. Perhaps instead of doing um, a whole tour of all of the monuments in your city, maybe you pick one monument, um, you know, something that's perhaps really meaningful, perhaps um, like I, I were um, – uh, NFDA were located um, in Brookfield, Wisconsin, which is um, a suburb of the city of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And in downtown Milwaukee, we have uh, the beautiful Veterans Park, so uh, where there's, you know, a very nice monument that recognizes veterans um, from all branches of the military and all wars. So, you know, perhaps it's organizing an event at one memorial where perhaps you bring in some speakers and you work with the local um, VFW or American Legion post where you invite the veterans in your community to be honored and recognized. Perhaps it's something that you do um, on Veterans Day or Memorial Day. Um, you know, so perhaps it's an event on a smaller scale where you're not doing motorcycle escorted tours throughout the city, but I think there's something really nice and meaningful that you might be able to do on a smaller scale. That's an excellent uh, point, Jessica. I'm so glad you brought up that park. I walk my dog there like at least once a week and um, <laughs> they have marathon every summer um, through that park. And I know that they have um, a couple of different events with the scouts to power wash the sidewalk. <laughs> and they, and Jessica, uh, they could use Facebook uh, uh, to do a veterans page uh, section on their Facebook and let people send in comments about their favorite veteran or send in pictures mm -hmm. for them to post. Or if their town had a, uh, we had one funeral home that gave away flags right in front of in front of the town parade, uh, little bitty American flags. They walked in, in, uh, prior to the parade right behind them, and um, that was a, a big. Um, that was just a small, simple thing, but it went over big and huge for the uh, people on an event trip. Mm -hmm. One thing we did was to invite the uh, honor guard from our local VFW. We, for several years, we've had some sort of a luncheon or a breakfast for them and hosted uh, that an appreciation event. And uh, even though you don't have hundreds of veterans in your building, you're honoring maybe 10 or 12. Uh, it becomes a, an, an, an event that is appreciated by hundreds of veterans. And then we took that and magnified it on social media with Facebook and, and as well as our local media. Uh, and so it becomes a huge event, even though there were only 10 or 12 people that were actually honored, it becomes a community event just by the fact of media. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's right. great. That's a great point, Ken. Mm-hmm. And Jessica, not a question, but another uh, caller had entered that they partner with a Relay for Life to do a marathon, and that is a fairly easy to accomplish task for a small staff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, organizing teams for um, runs and walks um, in your community are a great way for your funeral home to um, have a presence at those events. I know. Um, uh, yeah, Relay for Life is great. Um, you know, there are, you know, sometimes there are, you know, maybe a local hospital has um, a run or walk around a specific health issue. Um, yeah, so the, those are really great, easy ways that you can um, get involved. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> That's right. Good. Do we have any so other questions, Heather? Um, not a 
this moment, I know that the wheels are turning. So if anyone has any questions that are coming in after the webinar, please feel free to email us at nfda at nfda.org. And we can always email those out. Um, and I do want to thank our audience for joining us today and sharing. This has been a, a great resource and there's just been so many takeaways. Um, we do appreciate getting your feedback on today's webinar. So we encourage you to complete the evaluation survey that you'll receive via email. Don't forget to complete your uh, CE attendance form as well for CE credit. Um, we would also like to make you aware of some upcoming webinars. On March 22nd, we'll be um, joined by Dr. Stephen Benson and Mark Bush to discuss awareness and response for the opioid crisis. And on May 4th, we'll have sexual harassment training in the workplace um, with Joel Cullum for, from Sesco Management Consultants. Um, this does conclude today's webinar. I want to thank you, Jessica, for being our moderator today. And thank you so much, Ken and Dana, for sharing all of your wealth of experience with us. You have been oh. great. And thank you very much for um, everyone's time today, for the privilege of your time. Oh, it was great. Thank you so much for including us. Thank you, and have a great day.